Good afternoon. Well, I could start with telling you what my name is and who I am and what my story has been, but in the times of Google, I find it impolite because if you have been interested in who I am, you have probably looked it up already. If you have not been, but will be, you still may do that after this presentation. But if you have not been and will not be interested in who I am, no point talking about it. <laughs> so I could start with telling you what my view on lean and quality is and how they combine together and what the outcome is. But I'd rather start with a story. Well, three years ago, in Rzeszów, in the Lesser Poland, I was sitting in a big black sofa in a hotel lobby, and I was getting ready for a speech to talk about how to save time and maintenance. And I thought, well, I am going to speak about how to save time and maintenance. And I had traveled here for three hours, I will travel back home another three hours, so it's six hours of doing nothing but driving. Something was wrong. I mean, if I teach people how to save time and how, how to improve their processes, and I lose so much time, there must be something wrong. I did the maths, and I found out that on the average, in 2016, in the year 2016, on average, every month, I spent 48 hours driving, doing nothing but driving, 48, 48 hours, which is a six-day week or two consecutive days. That's a lot of time. And if you multiply it by 12, it's more than a month that you could gain back to do whatever you want to do or whatever your clients pay you to do. Can I do anything about it, I thought. And by the time I got back home, I had three options. Option one was I could find clients living or working closer to my place. Is that a solution? <coughs> Good. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that is right. I mean, if I want to work for the clients I like to grow for, and if I want to um, find the customers or clients that will help me grow. Some, sometimes their premises are 300 or 400 or 1,000 kilometers away from my place. So it's not very easy to bring a process to my home. I mean, I'm not on that level yet. So option three, option one was crossed out. Option two was drive faster. <laughs> Is that a good option? No. Not really, because it's risky, it's dangerous, and it could last very short, because I would lose my driver's license. But if I drove 10 to 20% faster, I could gain like 10 more hours a month. Option two crossed out. Option three was don't drive a car for work. How does that sound? Terrifying, right? <laughs> I stopped driving my car to work. Of course, I try to work online with customers, but it's not always possible. And I, so I started using trains or planes or any other means of transportation. And actually, I traveled so much that I managed to write a book. And it's Lean Management, the Polish way, for those of you who don't read Polish. Unfortunately, it's published only in Polish, but I'm so proud of this book because it was a best-selling book at some point of time and it still sells well. But I also like to say that I wrote it in no time, basically, because I just got the time back. In fact, I got so driven by the success of this book that I wrote another book. So it was published a year later in 2018, last year in October, and it's called The Problem Solving Clock in Polish. And it's a problem-solving method that I've been using for many years, and I just described it in the book. The process of writing books is mostly waiting. You wait for the concept to come, you wait for the words, then you wait for editing, for publishing. So when I was ready with the book, it was June last year, I just sent it to the publisher, and I went, went for vacation because the book was going to be published in October. 
We went to Greece with my family. It was very nice because the, the air temperature was um, not killing. The water temperature was very nice, it was warm. The beaches were not crowded because it was two weeks before the season started. So they just basically walked on the beaches and we dove in the water. And one of those dives I remember very well because I remember the moment I jumped and the big green rock that I hit with my head. And guess what? Um, for a few hours, I didn't know whether I would walk, whether I would talk, whether I would live the life I used to live. I just didn't know anything. Neither me, nor my wife, nor my four-year-old son. I walk, I talk, <laughs> so it's all ended up well. Could have been different. But for the few days that I spent in the hospital, I was thinking about the things that are valuable in my life. And guess what? There were no cars, no fancy clothes, no houses, no, no money. Just the things that are valuable. When I got back home, I drew a big map. Actually, I didn't draw it because I um, did it on the computer, but I put all the activities, all the relations, all the um, thoughts, all the businesses, just everything that was around me, I put it on the map. And it was so big, when I printed it out, it was in the A3 format. I mean, it was so, the font was so small, I could barely see it. So many activities, so many things that were around me. And I decided to minimalize it, to live the minimal way. So I started crossing things out from my life. Relations, um, businesses, activities, and so on and so forth. Actually, there's another book that I'm going to buy. It's going to be published in November this year, November the 14th is the premiere, where I described it. But now you may wonder, this guy is supposed to talk about lean or quality and he's selling us his stories. Why is he doing that? I don't know. <laughs> I'm doing that because what I found in the minimal life is happiness and quality. I mean, when you do less, you have more time for good things, for quality. And that applies to your personal life, that applies to your um, professional life, and just any, anything you do. And that reminds me of the difference that Michael Ballet stated once. And he stated the difference between the outcome and output. Do you know the difference between the outcome and the output? I didn't know either. <laughs> the difference is, when you go to the doctors, what is it that you expect, that you want from the doctors? You want the doctor to be available, right? Because you're there. You don't want to wait in a waiting room with the coughing patients. You just want to be cured. You just want to be served. So availability is what you're counting for. Accuracy? You want the doctor to look at you for five seconds and tell you what you're done with and not be wrong. Is that right? So accuracy? No? Not five seconds. <laughs> but that's, maybe you're different, but most clients, most customers don't want to wait. They just want expertise. And they pay for, to do that. So availability, um, accuracy. Do you want the doctor to be nice? It wouldn't hurt. <laughs> okay, so attitude matters too. And you also want good advice. Because if the doctor tells you what, what's wrong with you, then they have to give you a prescription. And those are the four A's. Availability, accuracy, attitude, and advice or solution in case of 
um, some other processes. That's what Michael Ballet defines as the four A's of good customer service or customer experience. Now, do we need all the four A's? Let's look at some examples. Like, if you look at Apple, are they available? No. Pretty much. Yeah? There's stores around the world. I mean, you can just walk in and get a device. Yeah? They're always affordable. <laughs> okay. But available. <laughs> okay. That's why I <laughs> See, in my minimal life, money doesn't matter. <laughs> because I am free from buying things that I don't need. And if I need them, I just need them. Um, what's the attitude of Apple? Are they nice? Very nice. Advice, their devices are okay. <coughs> Very good solutions, trend setting in the whole world. But what about accuracy? All those who own Apple devices, I'm a fan of Apple too, know that um, all those fans live in the iCloud bubble. I mean, you can't really get out if you haven't. How do you recognize an um, Apple owner, Apple device owner? He's going to tell you himself. <laughs> Does anybody have a charger, iPhone charger? <laughs> Everybody has chargers, but not for an iPhone. Right? So it's not really accurate. One A is missing. Now, let, let's look at Tesla. Is it a good solution, good advice? Very good. Groundbreaking, game changer. Attitude, they're nice, all of them. Are they accurate? Not really, they are. Yeah, but if you want um, to be seen, and if you want to show that you drive an electric car, or whatever, they're, they're accurate, they, they solve your, your problem. They, they have, uh, they can reply to your need. Are they available? No, no. <laughs> no way. I mean, you have to, including myself, you have to wait like 10 months or 12 months for a test like that, and you don't know whether you're going to get it or not in that time. So, one A is missing. Now, let's look at doctors or lawyers. Are they available? Pretty much. Are they accurate? If they're good, they mostly are. They have good advice, well, mostly, but their attitude is sometimes not what we would like the kid to be, because a good lawyer will not be nice. I don't want to offend anyone, but yeah, sometimes they're nice, but if you have killed someone and they're going to um, substitute for you, they will probably tell you that you are not nice and they will not be nice to you. Okay, so let's look at companies like McDonald's or Coca-Cola or finance brokers, for instance. Are they available? Pretty much, yeah. Are they accurate? Yes, they are. And do they have nice attitude? Are they nice? Very nice. But their solution is somewhat not healthy, not trendy. <laughs> Doesn't change the world. And that applies to McDonald's or Coca-Cola or finance brokers. I mean, Woody Allen said that a finance broker is a guy who invests your money until it runs out. That's just a <coughs> citation. So, in every time, we're missing one A. So maybe the recipe, the prescription for good customer service, for good customer experience, or for outstanding customer experience, is to miss one of the A's. I mean, I couldn't think of a company, of a worldwide company, that's, that's known to everybody, and having all the A's all right. Okay? Every time there's one A missing, just any A. That's just my view on Michael Bollet's for a policy. 
So, what do clients, customers really value in your products and your services? It's the right something. I mean, probably most of your customers, most of your clients, just take it for granted that you provide good service or you have a good product. A product or service that doesn't break down and uh, there's just doesn't have a lot of flaws. But they want that something, that not being available or not being so healthy or whatever. So maybe that's the, the right click that they want and that they look for in your services. Some of you may think that I'm telling you to spoil what you do to provide defects. And I will come back to them, if you allow. Steve Jobs said once that advertising quality does not work because people do not form their opinions on quality based on your advertisement. Is that right? They form their opinions of your product or service based on their experience or somebody else's experience. So, that's the way it goes. And I'm going to tell you another story, a story of my friend owning a restaurant in Warsaw. His restaurant is located in an office quarter in the center of Warsaw. Skyscrapers, nice ties, and you know, many people, like, a year ago, many people would queue and wait to be seated in his restaurant because there were not enough um, tables. And my friend wanted to be, wanted to solve the problem, he saw, and moved in for more tables. He used to have 20 tables. He moved in for more, which is, he increased his capacity by 20%. <coughs> and guess what happened? the utilization during rush hours dropped down to 60%. Why is that? People no longer wanted to come to his restaurant. He called me in and we tried to find a solution, so we made a survey. And in the survey, we asked the customers, ex-customers and the customers to be, why do you like or you dislike this specific restaurant? And most of the answers was where um, it used to be a private place where you could come with your partners, clients, or suppliers, or whatever, friends, and you could just sit so privately. Now it's become a little crowded and we don't like it. We choose other restaurants. So the value was somewhere else. It was not in the number of tables, or it was in the number of tables, and the low number of tables. But my friend said, okay, if I move the tables out, then I'm going to lose 20% um, capacity that he was not using anyway. So what's gonna happen? I said, increase your prices, 20%. I knew it from the survey that the customers wouldn't even notice some of them. They wouldn't bother, they wouldn't mind it. And that occurred and that proved to be true. Because now, this year, the restaurant's um, running pre pretty well. And there's queues waiting outside, like it used to be, and everybody likes it again. And the prices are 20% increased. The value, the, the key to understanding this story is the value was somewhere else. I mean, he was looking for the value like he would see it. And that's the difference between the outcome and the output, because we usually don't look at uh, from a customer's point of view. The customer wants availability, accuracy, attitude, and advice. Thank you. But we have to pay our bills. So we look at number of patients in a day, time per patient maybe. So the customer has um, PPMs, quality defects, and we have our own PPMs, patient per minute. And that doesn't match sometimes. So that is something I'd like you to be aware of, that the customer point of view can be something very different from your point of view. And if you look at your outputs, your KPIs, your whatever you're um, targeted with, you 
probably will not see the other perspective. Sometimes they might be different. Um, let me tell you another story. Do any of you remember the Fox, uh, Volkswagen Phaeton? Remember the car? Did any of you, has any of you owned one of those cars? Was it a good car? Brilliant. It was a very good, brilliant car. It was like 10 years ago, maybe. But what was wrong with the car? The Volkswagen Phaeton was a car, was a monument of what VW could do as a product. Ferdinand Pich, the president of Volkswagen at that time, just wanted to make something that people, that, that would be outstanding, outstanding quality, outstanding product. And it was a brilliant car. It was an outstanding car. Probably the best one. It was a Bentley and the body of a VW. But the problem with this car was that it cost $120,000. And people just didn't want to, buy, to pay $120,000 for a Volkswagen. Some of them would pay $170,000 for a Bentley. But they wouldn't pay $120,000 um, for a Volkswagen. It's dead. It's no longer in the market. So the quality or the value as Volkswagen saw it was not where the customers saw it. Another example is a guitar. For those of you, does anybody play the guitar? Okay. okay. So you probably know that um, any guitar, any electric guitar, it doesn't sound loud. I mean, you need to process the sound from the strings through the, we call them pickups, the magnets, that process the sound and through a chord, they process it to the amplifier to make it available for people to hear it. So every guitar has to have pickups. The problem is, that the sound of a guitar depends on so many factors, so many things. It depends on the wood, it depends on the shape of the guitar, it depends on the way the body is joined with the fingerboard, and so on and so forth. And that is why musicians need to use many guitars to play one song or one record, or just play many songs. And it's not a problem in the, uh, in the studio, but it gets complicated on stage. If you want to play your songs, you have to have many guitars on stage. You probably have seen it many times in the rock concerts, if you go to any. Is there a solution? Yes, a few years ago, the solution was the Variax. And the Variax by Line 6 was a great solution because it had no pickups. It actually had one piezo pickup that would um, grab the sound and process it digitally. And with a twist of a knob, you could actually have any sound of any guitar in the world playing just one guitar. Very comfortable, very easy. Again, the problem was, I used to play one, and uh, every time I got off the stage, my friends would say, well, you have a guitar, you have no pickups. No. And that was a problem. That was a real problem that people expected, guitar players, musicians expected pickups on a guitar. And they just didn't buy this product. It's a great product, but no longer sold because the market said no. And the same thing applies to amplifiers. I mean, nowadays, these days, we don't really need amplifiers to amplify your sound. We need computers or anything. But sometimes people pay for the looks and the value is in the looks. And this is what you see Backstage. This is a real picture from backstage. Mm -hmm. You have to bring the cabinets because that's what the customers want to see. The spectators just wow because you have a great wall of Marshall amplifiers or something. So that tells me that the value is mostly somewhere else. And actually, I said something about quality issues. Do you, do you like quality issues or not? You do? Yes. Okay. Do you make mistakes? No? Raise your hands, please, if you make mistakes. 
<laughs> okay. Please raise your hands if you have never made a mistake. Okay. How you have it. Please clap your hands to this guy. Because, uh, yeah. Well, I'm not that good. I make mistakes all the time, actually. So, quality issues can be good opportunities to solve problems, solve customer problems, and to show that you care. Imagine you have a customer who bought something from you, be it service or product. He just bought it because you were first off, because you were cheaper or you had promotion, whatever, just by accident. He bought it from you, and it's it broke down. What's he doing? He's finding what it was, who made it, and then he's calling you. Okay, I bought from you and I have a defect, please solve it. You might say, I don't know, I will ask. We have to check it, please send it to us, we will exchange it, whatever. That's the standard approach. But you might also say, thank you. Thank you for reporting this defect. We have never come across this defect, this type of defects. And this is a great opportunity for us to grow and to develop and maybe to improve our product. Thank you very much. You don't discuss with that guy. You just send him what he bought from you and it broke down. You just send it to him again, maybe two pieces. Or you do something for them if it's a um, piece of service. But you're grateful. You're grateful for reporting defects. Who do you think the guy will buy from next time? You, because you have solved their problem. They had a problem. The problem was not um, they wanted to use your product. The problem was the, pro the product they wanted to use broke down and you reacted well. Maybe you remember speaking about Apple a few years ago. Um, customers found out it's not that they heard. They found out that Apple was slowing down the processors and the devices that were second to newest because they wanted to sell their newest devices. That's obvious to me. But when the customers found it out, they called Apple and said, you're doing this. And what did Apple say? Yes, we are. Of course we are. We do it because we care. We care about your batteries. Because if we, that's true. If we hadn't done it, your batteries would have done, died and you wouldn't be able to use the advice the way you are used to do. And, and moreover, you can go to our store and get a new battery, get a replacement, 70% discount, whatever, blah, blah, blah. People did it. I just I have a couple of friends who said, well, they care, they care for me. And they rushed to the stores and replaced their batteries. And guess what? It was an additional billion dollar of income for Apple. So a quality issue was an opportunity to show you care, if you really care. If you don't care, just don't get these opportunities. Please Think for yourselves now about it, any quality defect or problem you had, you've had um, recently. How did you react? Did you say, no, <coughs> don't know, I'll find it out? Or did you say, thank you? I actually, this year, a few months ago, I gave up my BMW because I used to have three BMWs and two of them were fine, very good. But the last one was faulty. I mean, it broke down very many times. It was not a problem though. The problem was the reaction, the service reaction, the service guy's reaction to it. Arrogance, impoliteness, lying. Maybe it's just my experience, but it is my experience and I'm a customer too. So I said, I don't want your cars anymore. I just gave it up. And I said, I know they're good cars, but it was just the 
value of service that I didn't buy, that I didn't want. Please raise your hands if you've driven a car before. <laughs> okay, most of you. How many cars have you driven in your life? Ten? Twenty? A hundred? Fifty? None of us has driven all the cars in the world. Is that true? Okay. But we have opinions. We know what an Audi feels like, we know what a Volkswagen feels like, we know what a Renault feels like, and so on and so forth. How do we know that? From opinions of others, from magazines. Yeah. So people form their view on quality on opinion on the opinions of others. And let me tell you another story. Um, I'm a guitar player, I said that today. So two months ago I was playing a gig actually nearby and playing concerts is also mostly waiting when I mean, you wait for something the gig is just an hour long but you always wait and i was waiting after the sound check i was waiting for my turn on stage and i was standing close to the stage and i was drinking beer and then i saw a guy waving at me he had a dirty jacket on, um, a rugged bag on his shoulder, and was holding two cans of beers in his hand. And he was waving it. And I thought, okay. <laughs> hey, brother, how much do you need? And he says, well, there's a camera here. There's a camera over there. You're not allowed to drink beer here. You can be fined. You know what I mean? We call it paradigms. Sometimes paradigms help us. I mean, when you get out this building, you will probably your paradigm will tell you on which side of the road to to drive. Okay? Paradigms help us. But sometimes paradigms also block us from finding solutions to our problems. But there's a way to cope with that. Do you want to try it? You do? This sign is for yes and this one is for no. <laughs> Okay, so if you want it, it's just three questions that you can ask yourselves. I mean, if you need pieces of paper, they're available over there, but you can just think of answers to these questions. And the first question is, what is it you have always wanted to do and you've never done it? Maybe somebody has wanted to fly a plane, for instance. Okay? Just give yourselves a few seconds to think about this. Maybe you will always wanted to be a, I don't know, information IT guy. Now, when you've asked your question, uh, this question, there's another question. What has been stopping you from doing it? If you've always wanted to fly a plane, what has been stopping you from flying a plane? Kids, I have no time. Money, have no money to buy a plane or rent a, rent a plane. Okay? Those are obstacles. But the most powerful one is the third question. And the third question is, what would have to happen to let you do it? And you know, you have always wanted to fly a plane. And you have had no money or no time. And now you're thinking about possibilities. Okay, about opportunities, how to change it. And then you find out, well, really, I have no time, but I spend a, an hour a day on Facebook. Maybe I should, and so on and so forth. You know what I mean? This third question, when you ask it to yourself, or it's even better if you ask it in public, surrounded by the people you know or you don't know, and they keep telling you answers. What would have to happen to let you do it? It's very dangerous. Because some of you might resign from the life you're leading at the moment. That's what I did, actually, at some point of my time. 
So lean, to me, is solving problems. It's continuous improvement. And it's looking for waste. If you want to change your life, be it professional life or private life or personal life, and you keep asking yourself these questions, you may identify muda, you may identify what you don't like in your life, in your process, and then you might think of solutions, and then you might grow based on that. And on top of that, should, um, there should be customer focus. If you keep your customer in mind, your client in mind, then it's much easier. Are there any hints? If you want an outstanding customer experience, you have to remember that people like to be treated as VIPs. Do you like to be treated as VIPs? Yes or no? Who doesn't? Okay. <laughs> there are some. But if they, if they are aware, you can treat them as VIPs and they will be grateful. So, if you treat people as VIPs, then they will come to you to solve their problems. Um, that reminds me of the era, because I'm kind of old. And I know if I need a new computer, um, I usually look it up, up on the internet and compare and just look for it. But my young friends, they would go, I'm considering a new computer, anybody, anything, <laughs> give me your offers. The cost is nil, zero. They're just waiting for your offers to come. VIPs, right? So if people want to be treated as VIPs, just treat them as VIPs. <coughs> I mean people, I don't mean businesses or companies because um, it's all about people. That's hit number one. And the rule number two is be honest. Sounds funny, huh? If you want to communicate clearly, you have to be honest. I mean, look at the low fare airlines, or cheap airlines, as you would like to say. Um, if you're used to traveling with, I don't know, Lufthansa or Emirates, you're probably used to a very comfortable seat, um, a meal on board or two, and kind of luxury um, travel. And you pay for your ticket more than you pay with Wizard, for instance. But those low fare airlines, they are honest with you. You still can have a comfortable seat. You still can have a lot of space. You still can have a meal on board if you want to and if you pay extra money. But you can't have it if you don't want it. You can sit on a bench or even stand on a plane or whatever. That's your choice. I mean, they're honest. They're telling you it's not going to be easy. We're flying to London one and a half hours and you're going to be standing. Yeah, you grab something better. But you have a choice. So they're honest with you. And rule number three is appreciate complaints. We've, I've spoken about this to treat and use complaints, quality issues, as opportunity. If you do that, you win. If you don't do that, you lose. As simple as that. And rule number five is have high standards and low response time. Because I know that Tesla doesn't have a low response time. <laughs> but still, if you're Tesla, maybe you shouldn't care about this. But on the average level, if you want to treat your customers or clients as VIPs, and if you want outstanding customer experience, keep your standards high and the response time low. On the last note, I'd like to say that um, we usually see quality as just a small part of our product or service. And for our customers, it's the outcome, not the output. So it's the, the outcome is 
it begins with the very first thought of even placing an order, which is buying your product or service, and it ends when the product or service dies, or even beyond. So if you think of the whole process, of the whole picture, not just the wide, the, 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 the very uh, narrow picture of your product or service, if you think of the whole picture, then you can provide your customer with outstanding customer experience. Thank you.